Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I will tell you about H. pylori's ability to survive in the worst place to live in the body, the stomach. The learning objectives are to recognize that H. pylori infection usually starts in childhood and persists for a lifetime. To explain some of the adaptations Helicobacter pylori uses to colonize and persist in the microbicidal environment of the human stomach, and to discuss some strategies H. pylori uses to evade the immune system. Although most H. pylori disease that we see is in adults, H. pylori infection happens in children. H. pylori is a childhood infection. The graph shows prevalence data from three different countries. As you can see, in less developed countries like Ethiopia and Mexico, children already have high rates of infection. In Ethiopia, 80% of the population is infected by age 10. Once a person is infected, the same strain remains for many years, and in many cases, for the lifetime of that person. H. pylori is not an acute infection. It is a chronic, persistent infection. How does H. pylori survive in its preferred niche, the stomach? The lumen of the stomach is literally a vat of hydrochloric acid with a pH of nearly one. The acid destroys most microorganisms and decontaminates your food. Where does this acid come from? The epithelium of your stomach is made up of glands and they contain different types of secretory cells. One important cell is called the parietal cell. In the drawing, you can see that the cell has an elaborate cell membrane which has pumps that secrete acid into the channels of the glands. The acid then makes its way into the lumen. However, the acid would also destroy your stomach tissue. So, there are other secretory cells that produce copious amounts of mucus. You can see these cells as the light-colored cells in the image. It's lighter in color because the cytoplasm is full of mucus. The mucus coats the entire stomach, protecting the surface from the acid. Now, if H. pylori prefers to colonize the stomach, you might think that H. pylori is very resistant to acid. It turns out that H. pylori hates acid. It can only survive in acidic conditions for brief periods of time. H. pylori is not found in the lumen of the stomach. It actually survives within the mucus where the pH is near neutral. H. pylori actively swims to remain in this mucus layer very close to the epithelial surface. In the photograph of a gastric biopsy from a patient, you can see the entrance of a gland lined by mucus producing cells. The dark rods are H. pylori bacteria and the ones circled are within the gastric mucus. If we look at bacteria when alive, they look like this in the movie, actively swimming both to avoid the acid and to avoid being flushed down with the normal flow of stomach contents. Their ability to swim is coupled to their ability to detect where to go, a concept called chemotaxis. Let me show you an example of chemotaxis for H. pylori. In these movies, you can see how H. pylori behaves when exposed to small amounts of acid leaking out of the needle. On the right, the bacteria clear the area nearest the needle tip in just a few seconds. They are swimming away from the acid. On the left, the bacteria don't swim away from the acid because these bacteria are H. pylori mutants that can't sense acid, so they don't respond in the same way. Although H. pylori can swim away from acid, they can be exposed to it. So H. pylori has multiple tricks to survive brief periods of acidic conditions. The most important trick is to use an enzyme called urease. It's the most abundant protein made by H. pylori. Urease efficiently breaks down urea into carbonic acid and ammonia. What's urea? Urea is a waste product of human metabolism and it's released into stomach secretions. H. pylori uses urease to break down urea, which then creates a buffered zone around itself. The pH is higher in this local area. This is an important adaptation for H. pylori to survive in the stomach. It's also an important concept for taking care of patients. Doctors can use a diagnostic test called the urea breath test. It's based on the trick I just told you about. In the urea breath test, the patient drinks a solution containing a carbon-labeled form of urea. If H. pylori is present, the bacteria will break down the carbon-labeled urea and create carbon-labeled carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is absorbed into the circulation, ending up in the lung, and exhaled. A special machine detects the exhaled carbon-labeled carbon dioxide. This is an important, non-invasive way of diagnosing H. pylori. I told you before that H. pylori swims away from acid and it prefers to reside in the pH neutral mucus layer. It not only detects acid, it also detects metabolites from the epithelial surface that attract it to the host cell. 
to reach the epithelium, H. pylori needs to get through the mucus, which is usually a barrier for most bacteria. H. pylori is different. It has an important adaptation, its shape. The movie shows you H. pylori's spiral shape, allowing it to easily penetrate and swim through the mucus layer without getting trapped. In the image, the bacteria in the circled area reached the epithelial surface and attached. Here's a movie of H. pylori exposed to an epithelial cell in culture. You can see how readily they land and attach to the surface, and they use specialized molecular adhesins to find specific receptors on the cell surface. H. pylori attaches to very special places on the epithelium. It prefers to attach to the region between cells called the intercellular junction. In the picture, you can see a three-dimensional reconstruction of the surface of an infected human stomach. The red color stains the borders of the epithelial cells. In blue are the cell nuclei. H. pylori stains green. You can see that they are concentrated in between cells rather than just on top of the cell. Why do H. pylori attach to epithelial cells? Well, H. pylori doesn't just attach to the epithelial cell, but it also replicates at the site and extracts nutrients directly from the cell. I'm going to show you a movie of two H. pylori bacteria that recently attached to epithelial cells. The cells are outlined so you can see the borders better. As the movie plays, you can see that the bacteria are not just attached, they are replicating. Despite the cells moving around, the bacteria stay in the same spot and grow right on the epithelial junction that they colonized. What you can see then at the end is a small colony of H. pylori that have grown in a location right over the intercellular junction. These observations suggest that H. pylori has adapted to colonize the specialized niche, which is usually devoid of microorganisms. H. pylori's proximity and attachment to the epithelium is recognized by our cells triggering immune responses. For example, the epithelial cells sense pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, and produce cytokines that trigger inflammatory cell recruitment to the gastric mucosa. Everyone with H. pylori infection develops histological gastritis. This means that a gastric biopsy will reveal inflammatory cells in the interstitial spaces between the gastric glands even in people with no symptoms. The picture on the left shows a normal, uninfected stomach. You can see the pink spaces of connective tissue between the glands. In contrast, on the right is a similar section of surface glands of the stomach, but this time in a person who is infected. You don't see the pink spaces anymore, but you do see a lot of nuclei between the glands which represent inflammatory cells, monocytes, lymphocytes, and neutrophils. Chronic inflammation from H. pylori infection is one of the reasons that leads to disease like ulcers and gastric cancer. All of these inflammatory cells are trying to kill H. pylori, but H. pylori bacteria don't die and can persist for many years. So how do they do this? H. pylori avoids clearance by evading the innate and adaptive immune responses. Here are some examples of evading the innate immune system. Recall that H. pylori is a gram-negative bacteria, so it has lipopolysaccharides, or LPS, in its outer membrane. LPS is a strong pro-inflammatory molecule recognized by toll-like receptor, TLR4. H. pylori actively makes modifications of the lipid A portion of LPS so that TLR4 can't recognize it very well. The modified LPS has been found to be a thousand times less inflammatory than LPS of E. coli. Here's another example of evading an innate immune response. Recall that the outer portion of LPS in bacteria is decorated with sugars called O antigens. H. pylori adds a fancier decoration to the O antigens using sugar residues that are specific to human glycoproteins. One example is our blood group antigens. The concept is called antigenic mimicry. It allows the surface of the bacteria to go undetected. A third adaptation example to evade the innate immune response is to hide its flagella and the proteins that make it. Flagellin is a potent PAMP that induces TLR recognition. Unlike other gram-negative bacteria, H. pylori sheaths its flagella with a membrane. It also mutates its flagellin molecules to avoid triggering TLR signals. H. pylori can also evade the adaptive immune system. One strategy is to induce immunological tolerance. 
Investigators have found that H. pylori infection results in expansion of regulatory T cells whose purpose is to downregulate inflammatory responses in the mucosa. H. pylori does this by actively secreting molecules that act on dendritic cells and T cells to modulate their differentiation.